Thanks. Uh, this is Patient-Centered Care Therapeutic Management of Lymphedema with Valerie W. Collins, PT, CLT, dash LANA, and Amber Cobia, PT, DPT, CLT. And so there's Valerie's bio, but rather than read that, let's find out the top four facts about her that she shared with us. So first off, uh, here we go, drum roll. Graduated from University of Connecticut with honors. Second, oh, come on, there we go. Certified in MLD and CDT from the Academy mm -hmm. of Lymphatic Studies. Certified lymphedema therapist from the Lympho Lymphology Association of North America. And finally, has provided UNC healthcare patients physical therapy since 2010. Valerie, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. What's one thing we should know about you outside of your uh, professional achievements? So uh, this past year, I just started taking pottery. And oh, I thought I would just be a natural because I use my hands all day and discovered, no, actually, pottery is very difficult. <laughs> It, it is indeed. I, I fit very well into that category of not having it come naturally. Uh, so, but good for you for pursuing it. That's great. Yeah. All right, Amber, uh, we've got Amber's bio there. Feel free to read that, but we're going to give you the top four. Received her doctorate in physical therapy from the University of St. Augustine. Holds a Bachelor of Science in Exercise Science from the University of Tampa. Certified lymphedema therapist from the Norton School of Lymphatic Therapy and specializes in both pelvic health and lymphedema physical therapy. Amber, welcome. Really glad to have you here. And I'll ask you the same thing I asked Valerie. What's something outside of your uh, professional achievements we should know about? <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Um, the biggest part of my life outside of what I do from, you know, nine to five every day are my three kids. I have twin four-year-olds and a six-year-old plus three wow. dogs on top of that. So life is, you know, pure chaos a hundred percent of the time. And it's fabulous. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Well, Hey, we are, we are really, really appreciative to have both of you here today. This is first time ever for this topic with the Lineberger Cancer Network. So glad to have you covering this. Uh, we'll be doing poll everywhere, as I mentioned. Our first question, which we'll, you'll be able to respond to for real in a minute, is the lymphatic system is a part of the circulatory and immune system. Uh, hopefully kind of a softball, true or false. Uh, while we're waiting for our audience to start responding to that, uh, here are our disclosures. I don't need to read those, but I do need to show those to everyone. And so here we go, and we'll wait 10 or 15 seconds, give everyone an opportunity to respond. Uh, for all of you in the audience, I just want to say thank you. I know that uh, your days are busy, and so you've made time today to, uh, to join us and participate, and we are very appreciative of that. All right. So, Valerie, Amber, how are they doing? Looking good. Looks good. <laughs> Got it. Great. All right. So without further ado, Therapeutic Management of Lymphedema, February 8th, 2023. I'll turn it over to both of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have a lot to cover, so we're going to dive right in and get started. So the learning objectives of this are um, to describe the basic anatomy and normal function of the lymphatic system, to identify who is at risk for developing lymphedema and who is appropriate for referral to lymphedema therapy, and to review some of our treatment options for lymphedema. So what is lymphedema? It is um, an accumulation of high protein fluid in the interstitial spaces due to a disruption in the normal lymphatic transport. Our lymph system basically um, is the waste removal system. And so we it helps to remove protein from the interstitium. So if there's a backup or a problem with the lymphatic system, you do develop a higher protein edema within those interstitial spaces. It is a progressive condition that requires consistent daily management. And who gets lymphedema? So worldwide, um, it's estimated approximately 120 million people um, can get lymphedema. 
And that is generally, though, from filariasis, which is a mosquito bite, um, and the larva of the mosquito um, go into the lymph nodes and block the lymph nodes and cause swelling. And it's predominantly in third world countries and um, uh, where is that going? Go <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, it's predominantly in third world countries and it predominantly happens in lower extremities. Um, in the United States, though, uh, we have one in 100,000 individuals with primary lymphedema. And we'll talk about that. A that's a little different than the one in 1,000 individuals with secondary lymphedema. So with increased cancer, um, survivorship, we do have more increased lymphedema risk. And also now, as the obesity rates are increasing, we're also seeing more increased lymphedema, particularly in the lower extremities. So again, our primary lymphedema uh, in the United States is only about 10% of the lymphedema. Um, and it's generally caused by malformations of the lymphatic system. It's most common in women, and it can be present at birth or may develop any time later in life, um, often during puberty or pregnancy. Secondary lymphedema accounts for about 90% of the lymphedema that we see in the United States. And it is a result of damage or trauma to the lymphatic system. Um, it can be from surgical procedures such as lymph node removal or radiation for cancer, but it also can be caused by traumatic uh, injury, infections, um, chronic venous insufficiency that, ha that is left untreated, um, there is a slight genetic predisposition. There are some genetic markers for that. Um, and But what is important to understand, um, of that 90% of the secondary lymphedema, um, about 68% is cancer-related. So if we are looking at a breast cancer patient population, about 40% of breast cancer patients develop lymphedema at some point after um, cancer treatments. Sarcoma patients is about 30%. Gynecological um, cancers are about 20%. Melanoma is about 16%. Um, uh, genital and urinary cancers get about, uh, is about a 10%. And then our lowest is our head and neck population, which is about 4%. Um, the thing to remember about breast cancer patients, um, depending on what study you read, it can be anywhere from zero to 70% after a mastectomy um, with axillary lymph node dissection. However, um, more recent information says that somewhere around 40 to 50% of breast cancer patients develop lymphedema um, after surgery or radiation as well. So this is just a slide showing you that, you know, at, we're getting more and more survivors in the United States, which is wonderful. Um, but with that, we have more and more complications. Um, and uh, one of those being lymphedema. Apologies for the delay here. Uh, so what percentage of women will develop lymphedema after breast cancer treatments is the question. And so your answers are A, uh, 10 to 20 percent, B, 20 to 30 percent, C, 40 to 50 percent, or D, 75 to 85 percent. So if if you would... Oh, dear. And Siri seems to have thought I was speaking. Apologies for that. Uh, so, <laughs> so hopefully, even though Siri didn't get that, you got that. And so we'll go ahead and uh, see what your answers were. And it looks like uh, we are trending with C, 40 to 50 percent. How are they doing? Very good. That's the correct answer. C is the correct answer. Terrific. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, the state of lymphedema, basically it is often underdiagnosed and undertreated. Um, there's a lack of awareness as it, that it is a common side effect of cancer treatment and its potential disability. Um, there's a lack of awareness that it is a side effect of obesity um, and untreated chronic venous insufficiency. Um, and we know that there's an increase and a rise in obesity and lymphedema 
Um, it has increased from 30 to 42 percent. So what are the signs and symptoms of lymphedema? This is something important if you have patients coming in. Um, one of the main things is asymmetry. Um, and that would be, so someone could have both of their legs be swollen, but one leg will be bigger than the other. Um, but other signs and symptoms a patient may tell you about is they may have aching or discomfort or soreness or pain in the body part that's affected. So it's not just arms or legs. It can also be a breast or the trunk or the abdomen or the head and neck. Um, and oftentimes lymphedema isn't terribly painful, but they'll tell you that it feels heavy or full or tight in their skin. They have less movement or flexibility in the neighboring joints. Um, sometimes their clothing doesn't fit, bras, underwear, jewelry, or their shoes start to feel tight. Um, they can have swelling that comes and goes or has pitting, and that's generally the earlier stages of lymphedema. Um, and then they may also have, <clears throat> excuse me, numbness or tingling in the involved extremity. <clears throat> Some of the risk factors for lymphedema are a high BMI, um, the, the amount of dissection that's occurred during their, their cancer treatments, whether or not they've had radiation or chemotherapy, whether or not it's their dominant or non-dominant side, particularly um, if it's their dominant side and they do a lot of tasks with that, they could develop lymphedema from overuse. Um, whether or not they've had delayed treatment for their swelling. So the earlier that we can get the patients in, the better, um, because if their swelling is more malleable and soft, we can effectively help that so much better than if um, a patient waits for years or decades before they seek help. Um, if a, a patient has cording or axillary web syndrome after surgery, that oftentimes will um, develop into more risk of lymphedema whether or not how their post-op course went, whether or not they've had a seroma, an infection, um, or if they also just have chronic edema, um, particularly in the legs. So there are some facts and myths um, regarding lymphedema. So lymphedema, <clears throat> excuse me, cannot be prevented, um, but the risk can be reduced. And we say this because sometimes there are patients who simply have maybe like a sentinel node um, biopsy um, and they don't have very many lymph nodes removed and they do get lymphedema. And then we have other patients who have all of their lymph nodes taken out and they don't get lymphedema. So things that we do encourage patients to do are to try to maintain a normal BMI, um, do appropriate exercise that does not exacerbate swelling. We're very pro uh, exercise, but we want to make sure that it's not making the lymphedema worse. Um, we teach them excellent skin care to prevent infections because infections can also make the lymphedema worse. Um, to avoid tight or restrictive clothing or jewelry, <clears throat> use a compression garment if they do have a, a diagnosis of lymphedema or uh, chronic venous insufficiency. <clears throat> and to avoid repetitive tasks when, when applicable. Um, Certainly, um, if it's like exercise or something that they really enjoy doing, then we want to make sure that they have appropriate compression so that they don't swell if it's something that they really want to do. Um, there is limited research on <clears throat> air travel ca causing lymphedema, whether or not inject injections or blood pressure cuffs on the involved side could cause lymphedema. Um, and, you know, this is like a bell curve. So there are going to be some patients that that does cause lymphedema. Um, but for the most part, it, it doesn't. Um, heat or cold, we, you know, we try to tell them not to avoid um, really hot or very cold uh, water or like ice packs or hot packs, that type of thing. And then whether or not a compression garment helps with patients who are simply at risk. Um, that said, we do recommend them for patients, um, particularly if they're very um, nervous about, you know, they don't want to get lymphedema. It, it doesn't hurt to have a compression garment, um, but we just want to let them know that it's the, the research on that is very limited. So what are the stages of lymphedema? So the first stage is called stage zero and is considered subclinical lymphedema. 
And basically, the person has had some type of interruption to their lymphatic system. Either the lymph nodes have been removed or irradiated, um, and there's no noticeable swelling at this point, but the person is considered at risk of developing lymphedema. And lymphedema will move through stages. Um, so stage one is called spontaneously reversible lymphedema. Um, the swelling is soft. It goes up and down, and it's usually better in the morning, and you can see some pitting. Elevation will sometimes reduce the swelling. And so this is a really, um, this is the stage if we have patients that we want to see them in, either stage zero or stage one, so that we can educate them and then also help them get that swelling under control. <clears throat> Stage two is called spontaneously irreversible. So now the swelling does not go completely away and the skin starts to become fibrotic. It gets thicker and harder because again, the lymphatic system isn't working. We're starting to build up a lot of protein in the interstitium and that causes collagen to lay down. And so the this, this skin will now start to become harder and thicker. At this stage and beyond, elevation has no positive effect on the swelling. Um, so a lot of times patients will say, oh, I've, you know, I've elevated my legs and it doesn't go down. I, you know, I put my arm up in the air and it doesn't, it doesn't help um, because gen it will not help lymphedema. It helps venous return, but it does not help lymphatic return. And the third and final stage of lymphedema is elephantiasis. So the swelling has increased significantly and never goes away. Um, the skin is permanently changed and is dense, thick, and fibrotic. And the patients run the risk of getting um, cellulitis infections um, because the skin is no longer considered a normal type skin. All right, and here we have our next question. How would you identify that a patient may have lymphedema? And this is where you can go ahead and put in a word, and we'll look in and start uh, seeing what, what answers we get. But you can go ahead and start sharing those now. Mm -hmm. Increased swelling or feeling of fullness, absolutely. Asymmetry, Asymmetry. yes, that's key. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be unilateral. Asymmetrical yeah. swelling, good. Glad y'all are picking up on the asymmetry mm -hmm. piece. <laughs> yes. yes. This yeah. is great, and we'll keep uh, we'll keep putting more up. We're getting a lot of answers. Thank you so much to our audience for uh, so many responses. These are great. Yep, yeah. heaviness of the limb. Yep. Yeah. All right, and I, I think that's it for now. But that was <laughs> okay. really, we really appreciate all those responses from the audience. Excellent. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the lymphatic system. Um, you know, I, when we're screening these patients that um, might have lymphedema or treating the patients that do have lymphedema, I think it's important to understand um, exactly why it's happening. So the lymphatic system works with the circulatory system to um, move fluid. It is a half circuit system, so it has a beginning and an end. When fluid is distributed throughout the body, the veins are responsible for bringing about 80% of that fluid back. About 10% stays in the tissues, and then 10% is brought back by the lymphatic system. So once fluid from the interstitium enters the lymphatic system, it's called lymph. The lymph fluid is comprised of protein, water, fatty acids, cell fragments, and particles, and bacteria. So this is, you know, your body's waste system. It's getting all the cellular debris and all the extra stuff out of the interstitium. The fluid and um, all the other molecules enter 
the capillaries, they go through the vessels, and then they're dumped into the terminus, which is at the venous angle. So this is where the lymph meets the blood. This is where um, the lymph combines into the um, jugular vein and the subclavian vein to return to the circulatory system. These are the vessels of the lymphatic system. We have superficial and deep vessels. I mentioned that the fluid enters the capillary. It then goes to pre-collector vessels, but fluid can also, the pre-collector vessels are absorbent as well. So fluid can also enter there. And then it's moved on to the collector vessels. And this is where the muscles are. This is where the functional units of the lymphatic system are. They're called lymphangions. So this is what actually moves the fluid. Now in that middle picture, you can see where there are valves. Um, some of the vessels allow fluid to move in both directions. These are the anastomoses specifically, which we'll talk about. Um, but it also prevents in other vessels, the backflow and allows the fluid to get to where we need it to go. Thanks. So I really like this picture to show the complexity of the lymphatic system and the relationship with the other systems in the body. Uh, fluid can be moved in a few different ways. One is the intrinsic contractions of those lymphangions that I mentioned, um, but also we can rely on muscle pumping, respiration, the arterial pulses help move fluid, um, and also MLD, which we are going to talk about. Now, watersheds are territories. It's an area of skin that um, each territory is drained or goes to one specific lymph node bed. So these territories are not, um, it's not an obstacle. Think of it like a state line. Fluid can cross, but it doesn't typically. So there are bridges that can go from one territory to the next. They're called anastomoses. And this is what we utilize when one area of lymph nodes has been impacted. Lymph nodes have been removed, it's been radiated, what have you. Um, if that lymph node bed is affected, then we try to encourage the fluid to go to one of the neighboring lymph node beds by building these anastomoses, these bridges across the state lines. The bridges are always there, but they're typically dormant. And that's where the MLD comes in to wake those bridges up and get the fluid moving across them. Edema is a failure of the lymphatic transport system. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the difference between edema and lymphedema and how one can affect the other. This graphic shows a normal lymphatic system. So that line across the top, the transport capacity, that is how much fluid your lymphatic system can transport at any given time. In a healthy lymphatic system, the lymphatic load, which is how much fluid is actually in your lymphatic system, is only about 10% of its maximum transport capacity. The bottom line, the lymph time volume, that's the amplitude and frequency of those intrinsic contractions of the lymphangion, the, muscle, um, the functional units. So that lymph time volume, it can increase if we need it to. If there is an excess fluid for some reason that is short-lived, then we, our lymphatic system can manage pretty well by increasing how much those muscles are working and how um, quickly those contractions are happening. This graph represents dynamic insufficiency. In dynamic insufficiency, the lymphatic system is perfectly intact. The transport capacity is the same, but the lymphatic load, the fluid volume is too high. So you can see where that lymphatic load, instead of being 10% of the maximum, it has surpassed it. This is where the lymph time volume can increase. Your lymphatic system is working a bit harder. 
But over time, the system can get overwhelmed. And then we'll talk about that in a second. We can actually end up with a combined insufficiency of the lymphatic system just exhausts and can't keep up. Mechanical insufficiency is what we see in our patients after cancer treatments. This is where there's an actual damage or problem with the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic loads are high, but the transport capacity is lessened. Now I'm going to back up a little bit. So combined insufficiency, like I just mentioned, is a combination of the dynamic insufficiency and the mechanical insufficiency. So this is, um, you know, where we might see someone with cardiac edema or chronic venous insufficiency that has had edema for a long time. Their lymphatic system is exhausted, overwhelmed, and now isn't functioning to its normal capacity. So now we've got a bit of both going on. So edema versus lymphedema. Edema is a symptom of something else going on. It's not a disease in and of itself. It's an abnormal accumulation of fluid within the interstitial spaces of the body that's visible or palpable. Um, it can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be systemic. It can be coming from the thyroid, the kidneys, liver, cardiac insufficiency, immobility, chronic venous insufficiency, or just an injury. Lymphedema is an abnormal accumulation of protein-rich fluid. And the protein part is important because those extra molecules in that fluid are what requires the lymphatic system. The molecules are too large to go into the blood capillaries. And so the venous system isn't able to take this protein-rich fluid back into the circulatory system. It's chronic and progressive. It is a lifelong disease. It's not something that goes away. The fibrous protein deposits cause skin changes. And back to the asymmetry, it is typically worse on one side than the other or only present on one side. So these pictures demonstrate they're both chronic venous insufficiency, but that first one is strictly edema. And the second one is that combined insufficiency. It's where the edema has developed into lymphedema. And lipedema is um, not the topic of the presentation today, but I think worth mentioning. Um, lipedema is an abnormal accumulation of fatty tissue. Um, it is symmetrical typically, and it is typically foot sparing as well. Um, MLD doesn't work so great with <laughs> lipedema because we can't move the fat tissue around like we can move fluid around. But lipedema can lead to lymphedema um, because those abnormal fat accumulation areas actually lead to a corkscrewing of the lymphatic vessels, which are then going to impact the lymphatic system, leading to both abnormal fat accumulation as well as the fluid accumulation. Okay, so now we're going to talk about lymphedema and its effect on the body. So again, any body part can be affected. Um, the head, the trunk, extremities, genitalia, not just arms or legs. So when a patient comes into us for a lymphedema evaluation, we also look at many other things as therapists. We look at range of motion and strength and their mobility and things like that. Um, but if you start to think about a swollen body part, it's going to have effect on, on mobility and things like that. So a person who has lower extremity lymphedema may have back or hip pain or knee pain. They're probably going to have an abnormal gait because they're carrying around a very heavy leg. Um, they may have difficulties with transfers or going up and down stairs. Their clothing doesn't fit. Their shoes may not fit correctly. And so they might be an increased fall risk. If it's their upper extremity, they might also have decreased ability to perform their ADLs. They might have trouble using their arm. It might be too heavy to style their hair. They may have trouble if their hand is swollen with holding things, uh, opening jars. 
They may have decreased grip strength, um, difficulty reaching overhead, again, difficulty putting clothes on and off or poor fit to the clothing. Um, they may also have loss of strength and range of motion and pain in that arm. With truncal lymphede lymphedema, um, the person may have poor fit to their clothing, um, issues with, with their body image. Sometimes they have pain um, and also loss of mobility. Breast lymphedema. So many of our patients develop breast uh, lymphedema. Again, um, they've already been through a lot with their cancer treatments, and now they have uh, an abnormal sized breast, so they may have poor body image. There's going to be a difficulty fitting bra and clothing. Oftentimes they have to get a bra for the larger side, and then they have to get a prosthetic on the other side to try to get the bra to be even. Um, they could have shoulder and back pain and also breast pain with breast lymphedema. And finally, genital lymphedema. Um, patients, um, this really can affect the way they walk, their ability to transfer, um, poor fit to clothing or finding clothing that will fit them. Um, they have poor hygiene with toileting and or difficulty toileting. And then again, poor body image. And with our head and neck lymphedema patients, again, they may have a poor body image, decreased uh, cervical and upper extremity range of motion and strength from the surgical interventions and radiation. They could have speech and swallowing difficulties, headaches, jaw pain, and trismus. So some indications for when you would want to refer a patient to us for therapy. If there's a loss of functional use of the limb due to the size, the weight, or the loss of range of motion. Um, girth measurements we take, we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. Um, we take girth measurements of the limbs and to determine whether how swollen the person is. But if you were just kind of looking at someone, you can you want to take girth measurements either every five centimeters or 10 centimeters on the arm or the leg. And then um, if you notice a two centimeter difference at three or more points, that's usually a good indication that the person has something going on and needs to see a lymphedema therapist. Um, another indication for treatment would be scar tissue formation that is limiting range of motion and disrupts the normal lymphatic pathways. So we can do myofascial techniques to help soften the scar and improve lymphatic flow. So that's another reason to send patients to us. Certainly for palliative care, for pain relief, and to prevent further loss of function, um, I would say that would be um, better done, better serve the population as um, earlier on rather than more in the very end stages of their of their cancer. Um, it's often very difficult for the PM, the families and the patients to come see us in outpatient, especially if they're very end stage. Um, loss of motion that limits radiation positioning. So sometimes our patients will need to be getting on that radiation table and they don't have range of motion in their shoulder um, to allow for them to get the radiation. And then certainly for our head and neck cancer patients, if they're having obviously range of motion issues, but also swallowing difficulties, trismus, and those types of things. So um, our treatments are contraindicated for a certain population. If a patient has uncontrolled congestive heart failure, um, cardiac edema. Again, we don't want to be pushing lots of fluid back to the heart and lungs if they're already with limited capacity. Um, if they're in renal fa failure, um, if they have acute infections, um, we are not allowed to see them. That is contraindicated. However, after they've been on antibiotics, usually for about 72 hours, or their skin is really starting to clear up, we can, we can resume treatment. Um, we wouldn't want to do anything with acute bronchitis. Um, malignancies, again, with medical clearance, we could we can work on. Um, acute DVTs or a thrombophlebitis, again, okay, once the clots are resolved. Peripheral artery disease with an ABI value of less than 0 0.8. Um, and also paresis, paralysis, or lack of sensation. While our, while our treatments are not contraindicated for that, um, it needs very close monitoring, and uh, either the patient needs to be very aware or the family members need to be very aware of that. Okay, so when we're evaluating lymphedema, um, it's not just about the swelling. We have to look at the whole picture of the entire patient for successful outcomes. <clears throat> Some of the things that we may assess 
We have outcome measures that um, gather subjective uh, information from the patient's cognitive, psychosocial, and financial status. Unfortunately, lymphedema treatment is not cheap. Patients need to purchase sometimes bandaging. Um, they need to purchase garments and typically a new garment every six months. Insurance coverage for these things is basically non-existent. Um, it's really, really difficult for a lot of people to afford the treatment that we can offer, unfortunately. Um, pain and sensation, um, posture, range of mo motion, strength, gait, balance, functional mobility, endurance, fatigue, cardiac status, urological, gynecological, and sexual function, nutrition. For all of these things, we'll make outside referrals as needed. So during our evaluation, we take circumferential measurements. And they're taken every four or five centimeters, uh, and then we calculate the limb volumes based on those circumferential measurements. Using a Gulick tape measure when possible, I mean, that's mm -hmm. as standardized as we can get with the circumferential measurements. You will find that measurements between therapists, there's a good bit of variability. Um, so it's important to have the same therapist measuring each time, if at all possible, especially if you don't have a Gulick tape measure on hand. So the gold standard for um, identifying limb volume are with bioimpedance. These are some of the skin conditions that we see, and this is something that we're looking at when we're assessing our patients too. There's fibrosis, there's um, pitting, there are papillomas, the poto orange skin on the breast there. Um, all of these are going to affect what we will do for treatment as well. This is the cording or the axillary web syndrome that Val had mentioned earlier on. Um, it can occur anywhere on the body despite the name. We're not really sure why it happens, but it can respond really quickly and really, really nicely to manual treatment and stretching. And we're also looking for radiation scar and infection complications. Um, the radiated tissue, scar tissue, that is going to, again, decrease fluid movement, but it can also create quite a bit of discomfort, limit range of motion, and some of the other things that we've looked at as well. So now we're going to talk about how we plan our care for the diagnosis of lymphedema, treating mild lymphedema versus uh, someone who has uh, like a stage two or stage three lymphedema. So generally, if the person has, um, we, we measure their volume, like uh, Amber said, we take circumferential measurements and we calculate their limb volume. And then from there, if they have less than a 10% limb volume differential, we might see that patient for several sessions. So we might see them for, you know, once a week for eight weeks or so, to make sure that they know how to take care of their skin, perform self-manual lymphatic drainage, make sure they get a good garment, um, and proper exercises for them. Um, we will monitor their skin and swollen areas and make sure that things are going down or stabilizing. And then the patient at that point is discharged to self-care um, and then they can return if they start to notice any changes in their skin or swelling. We would also address at this point if there's any uh, range of motion issues or, or all the other physical therapy um, things that we would look at. So, um, and then again, tell them if they need to come back, they, they know how and where to contact us. So if the person, though, does have greater than 10% uh, limb volume changes, we do what's called CDT or complete decongestive therapy. And this is, and sometimes we also call it an intensive. Um, and this is where we see the patient every day, usually five days a week. Um, and it can be anywhere from a couple of weeks to several weeks. It can be four to six weeks, depending on the amount of swelling, what the skin looks like, um, and how swollen, uh, how swollen the person is. And that consists of the patient will come in, we will perform manual lymphatic drainage. We may also um, 
we would teach the patient about good skin care, but there's times when we actually have to perform the skin care. Um, we put on lots of cream on the patients to keep the skin well hydrated. And then we would apply some type of compression bandaging or garment um, on them and then um, teach them lymphatic pumping exercises so that they can actually move that fluid through the body. And that's called decongestion. And then once the patient, um, again, we monitor them several weeks and we keep taking their limb volumes and we watch. And then eventually what happens is they basically um, kind of plateau. They reach a certain spot and it doesn't change. And that's when we know, okay, they're, they're finished with their bandaging and now we want to get them into um, their permanent garments that they can wear because the bandages are very large. You'll see um, shortly in some pictures. So that's not a practical thing for someone to stay in. We want to get them into garments that they can wear shoes or wear their clothes. Um, and so once we get them to their, to their self maintenance phase, once we get them, um, reduced, um, the patient then is expected to start taking care of themselves by doing self massage, taking good care of their skin, wearing their garments, doing exercises. And we might follow up with them, you know, one month, three months, six months, and one year um, to make sure that everything's going okay, monitoring their volumes and any exacerbations um, of swelling, um, making new garment recommendations. Maybe their swelling got better, they don't need as strong of a garment, or maybe their swelling is getting worse over time and they need a stronger garment. Um, and then we want them to return to their pre-morbid level of activities and exercise. And if they were not an exerciser, we certainly encourage them um, to become an exerciser. And we certainly encourage um, healthy eating, reducing BMI, those types of things. And then this is an example of some compression bandaging. So on the the one on the, on your, I guess it would be on your left, the lady that has her sneaker on. So that is the typical compression bandage. Those are called short stretch bandages as well as the arm. Um, and those are um, really nice because they're very malleable. Um, they allow us to every, uh, every single day change the shape of the person's arm or leg as they reduce. Um, but however, sometimes patients cannot bandage themselves or they don't have someone to help them. And so on the right is what's called a Medi Reduction Kit. And it's, um, it's um, oh, what's the material it's made of? Like a, um, it's like a scuba suit. It's <laughs> <laughs> and it has a bunch of Velcro. Um, and so the person, it's much easier for the person to put on and take off. And we can apply a lot of wrapping on that and, and we can control the amount of compression in that as well. Once again, they have decongested and once their limb is as small as we can get it, um, then we're going to get them into garments. So again, Amber had talked about the, how garments are very expensive and they really are. Um, so we have ready to wear garments that we can get patients that are less expensive, but oftentimes they don't fit a larger limb. Um, and they also don't, the ready to wears don't contain really bad lymphedema well. Um, so the person will end up swelling in those. So ultimately, we end up putting patients in custom garments, which again are very expensive. But that is a flat knit garment, and it's it's made custom to their to their limb. Sometimes patients also swell at night, um, or they have a lot of fibrosis that we need to address, and so we also will get them nighttime garments. Um, and these again very costly, um, also not the most comfortable thing. So um, patients will wear them, but sometimes the nice thing about it is they can take them off easily rather than bandaging uh, in the middle of the night if they get hot or something like that. Okay, and there are some other um, treatments that we can do in addition to the MLD and the bandaging and compression. Um, we often use kinesio taping to help um, just Again, in conjunction with the things that we're doing in clinic, we can use low-level laser therapy to address those really tough fibrotic um, skin changes. A pump, we often recommend for patients to have at home, um, especially if they're not doing the self-MLD consistently. The difficulty with pumps is that they, too, are very expensive, um, there are different levels based on how severe the patient's 
um, lymphedema is, how severe the skin changes are, how sensitive they are um, as far as pain and discomfort. But there are pumps that we can get for basically every body part that you might have Mm -hmm. swelling in. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the Lymphatouch is a modality that we often use in clinic. It's a little suction machine. It kind of mimics cupping, if you've ever seen cupping done, um, that again helps with those really tough skin changes. Other modalities and treatments that we can use, um, we can use them with cancer patients, not over active tumor sites, though. High-frequency TENS for electrical stimulation, ultrasound. Um, we can use textured roller sensory balls and vibration, mirror therapy, traction, as long as there's no previous spinal surgery, METs, or radiation to the spine. The laser therapy I've already mentioned, ionophoresis, um, NMES, which is neuromuscular electrical stimulation, kinetic exercises, aerobic exercises, massage, acupuncture, and meditation or yoga. <laughs> there are some medical interventions. Obviously, we are not doing these as therapists, um, but there are some clinical trials at Stanford looking at a couple of medications. And there are some surgical options. There's a lymph to venous attachment, liposuction, and lymph node transfers. Um, And just to note, the lymph node transfers are rarely done now because they haven't been as successful as other surgeries. And the surgical interventions are by no means a an ideal situation. Um, Those, any time that you do further surgical intervention, you do run the risk of further damaging the lymphatic system. All right, and here we have our next question. What are some treatment options for a patient with lymphedema? And you can go ahead and put a word or a phrase in there, and we'll go ahead and take a look at those next. And thank you. Those answers are already coming in. Physical therapy, excellent yep. answer. Yeah. <laughs> Bandages, yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, lots of compression. And we actually just said, uh, bear with us because I, we just had 20 more responses. So I'll <laughs> All right. up as quickly as I can. I'll make that 25. And I have to note, we just got an answer in the chat that was occupational therapy, also an excellent answer. Yes. Thanks, Stacey. <laughs> Not just PT. <laughs> I think one of the things when you say physical or occupational therapy is just to Make sure that if you're going to refer a patient, that you refer them to a certified lymphedema therapist. That could be an OT or a PT. Um, A lot of just physical therapists are not um, certified and don't necessarily um, know exactly how to treat lymphedema. Okay. Excellent. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, I think things have settled down. So okay. thanks to our good. audience for all the great responses. Excellent. Thank you all. Okay. So big takeaway points are that as there's an increase in survivorship, there's an increase in lymphedema. Early detection is crucial. Lymphedema is progressive. It will go from stage to stage. It will get worse if not, if it's not managed. Um, So those, you know, even if it's not visible yet, if your patients are saying that their arm feels heavy, um, that it's tight and uncomfortable, get them into us. We can help them more quickly and efficiently the sooner they get into us. Um, And an appropriate multimodal treatment is essential for successful outcome. We can't just treat the swelling. We need to, you know, requires collaboration between the providers 
it requires looking at the patient as a whole patient, not just a swollen limb. So this is just a quick slide on how to refer to us within the UNC system. Um, and you'll have access to these slides so you can refer back to how to get your patients to us. And that is it. Does anyone mm -hmm. have any questions for us? All right. And so what we'll do is we'll we'll take those questions through Poll Everywhere. So if you have not already, uh, go ahead and submit those there. While we're waiting for those to come in through Poll Everywhere, we do have a few that came in uh, through the chat as well. So the first one, what would you recommend uh, acute care therapists do when your patients are hospitalized. We know we can't provide what to do if we are not certified, but we often get consults for people with lymphedema. So great question, uh, Valerie, Amber. So I think um, our staff uh, generally will kind of email me or I don't know if you get emails from some inpatient staff. So sometimes I can help troubleshoot, um, but uh, I think you could, if the patient already knows they have lymphedema and knows how to care for their lymphedema, you could just reinforce all those things that they should be doing their self-massage and wearing their compression. Um, if it's someone who is developing lymphedema on an inpatient basis, um, I think you could um, talk to them about lymphatic pumping exercises. Um, and we have all these available as resources at UNC. Um, you you definitely would want to have the inpatient patient uh, get connected with an outpatient certified lymphedema therapist so that once they are um, released from the hospital, they have some place to go to get that addressed. The problem with inpatient is you probably don't have enough time to actually treat them and make effective changes, especially if they do need bandaging, because that can take weeks. So... Um, I, that's what I would recommend. Do you have mm -hmm. any other suggestions? And I'll just add patient education. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tell them how to find us when they get out. Ask for a referral to outpatient um, once they're discharged. Great. Thank you both. Uh, another, I, I'll go ahead and start uh, feeding some of the questions up into the onto the screen. Uh, why aren't these services supplies covered by insurance? Good question. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> um, there was actually just a bill passed, so we're hoping to see some change as far as Medicare is concerned in 2024, I believe, mm -hmm. um, to increase the coverage, but Excellent question. I would love a um, an answer from an insurance. Why, yeah, how does <laughs> why does insurance cover what they decide to cover? It's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, what is a Gulick tape measure? Do you have any answer you want? So a Gulick tape Little. measure has a it's kind of spring loaded on the end, so that when you wrap the tape measure around the limb, the reason there's so much variability when different people measure is that we put different amounts of tension on the tape measure, and so one person might indent the skin a little bit, and another person is just resting on there. So a Gulick tape measure has a spring on the end and a little ball, so that when you pull on it, it's a more objective way of keeping track of how much tension you're putting on the measure. So we're more consistent from therapist to therapist. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that question. Uh, can use of OTC compression socks assist with preventing future edema, lymphedema? So you can't prevent lymphedema, um, but certainly um, if someone has, uh, like in the, if they have chronic venous insufficiency and they have edema in their legs, then I would suggest compression socks for them. Um, you know, a lot of people swell on air air flight and it's it's really good to wear compression socks if you notice if you get off a uh, flight and your legs are swollen um so again there's some controversy in terms of you know does a ready to wear sleeve is that necessary if someone doesn't present with lymphedema after breast cancer uh surgery um so you know sometimes we will recommend a sleeve just if we know the person's going to be like doing a lot of athletics or something like that, but there's no um, great study that shows that by wearing compression, you're going to prevent lymphedema. 
Okay, thank you. And we we had a comment the first time, someone the first time they'd gone through uh, cancer surgery, lymphedema massage with compression bandaging was included in the treatment program, went for, uh, to, for massage three times per week for the first six weeks while being taught how to do the lymph drainage on their own. Um, so, so I don't know if the, if you would want to respond to that in any way, and I'll kind of add on to that. Or you know, as as we look at a different integrative medicine uh, techniques, and I'm thinking about a recent presentation on integrative medicine. Do you all have a sense of are there certain areas where where that can make a significant difference, and other areas where it it just did not seem to to yield the sorts of results that that uh, patients were looking for. Well, we don't we don't bandage patients unless they have over a ten percent differential, um, mm-hmm. because it's difficult and mm-hmm. it's cumbersome and time consuming. Um, if someone came in and, like I said, if they were under like a ten percent differential, we would probably get them a good sleeve and teach them self massage and things like that. Um, and we would see them for several visits to make sure that they were independent, but we wouldn't necessarily bandage them. Gotcha. And as far as I know, bandaging doesn't prevent lymphedema. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. And I do just want to make a clarification. I saw one of the, or looking Mm -hmm. back at the first question and um, with that comment, why aren't these services and supplies covered by insurance? Mm -hmm. The services are lymphedema Mm -hmm. PT is billed just like any other PT. If you're going to PT for an ankle sprain or after knee surgery, PT is um, covered just like any other PT, depending on your insurance plan. So just to make that clarification, um, we don't provide the the garments or the bandaging, but the PT services itself would be covered based on your plan. And also, um, the, some some insurance companies do cover the garments. It's not, it's not like all of them don't. Um, we've had issues with Medicare not covering, um, but most most um, private insurances do at least cover a portion of the garments. It's just that they're so expensive that the patients have financial difficulties with that. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we, we are at, almost at one o'clock. So let's take this one last question. As a radiation nurse, what can we do to assist? Send them our way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we want to see them even before they get radiation, but We can see them during radiation. We can see them right after, two weeks after radiation is complete, um, is the proliferation phase. And that's when we can make the most effective change for skin. So we want to see the patients throughout their cancer course. We'd love to see them pre-op and follow them all the way through. That's our ultimate goal. But um, refer them, refer them as soon as you notice any problems. Or even if they're not having problems and they just want to come and learn, we sometimes see patients just one time to show them how to do self-massage and, you know, get them a garment. We're happy to do that. And we do also um, occasionally see patients who are dif- having difficulty maintaining a position for radiation. Mm-hmm. So we can help with range of motion and soft tissue work there as well. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative. Uh, we really appreciate your expertise, your time today. Uh, we want to say some thank yous. We want to, uh, of course, thank both of you. We want to thank our audience for being here and for all the wonderful questions and uh, responses. We want to thank uh, the people of the state of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center here at UNC. Uh, we want to thank our team, Venny Obure and John Powell and Oliver Marth and Andrew Dodgson and Nadja Brown and Pat Muscarella for all the work they do for each and every one of these lectures.